Welcome to FPB's Meet the Candidates. This Cable 10 series allows you, the voter and the viewer, to learn a little bit more about the candidates that we have here in town and their views on the issues that are important to us. This is all leading up to the general election, which is on Tuesday, November 6th. Today's guest is Ronnie Nolan, and he is a candidate for the Franklin County School Board. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad that you took the time to stop by this morning. Absolutely. My pleasure. Uh, I thought maybe we'd start out with you telling us a little bit about yourself and why you have chosen to run for the school board. Sure. Uh, well, my name is Ronnie Nolan. I am an educator at heart. I've been working in the field of education for about 24 years. Um, all the way from as soon as I got out of college, really focusing my career on education um, from uh, higher education services all the way uh, to peak uh, just general ed public education throughout uh, my career. So I've had a, a, a wide ranging career in education. I do um, have a doctorate in education administration from North Carolina State University. I lived in Raleigh, North Carolina for a little while before moving back home to Kentucky where I, I did my studies there. And so for the last 14 years of those 24 years, I've actually worked as director of the Kentucky Educational Collaborative for State Agency Children. It's a state agency program uh, initiated by the General Assembly in 1992, uh, charged with providing educational services for children and youth who are in the care or custody of the Commonwealth. So we have about 83 programs across Kentucky, all across the state, uh, and they range from programs like um, group homes, like maybe the Methodist Home for Children. Um, all of those programs have schools located on their campuses. And we work with the local school districts in those communities to provide educational services for those kids. Oftentimes, uh, these are a group of students who um, have been very marginalized, um, have experienced significant trauma, um, have been involved with the justice system in some way, many of them, um, but they still um, deserve and have a right to a free and appropriate public education, sure. but oftentimes have issues that prevent them from being able to attend a, a traditional public school environment. So we work with those local school districts to set up schools on their campuses. Most of them have a school on their campus, and I've been working with that organization for uh, quite a number of years to make sure that that population of students in our state have an equitable and appropriate public education for them. That's great. Um, so, yeah, that, so that's kind of my yeah. work. Um, and that really has been my passion, is working with students who have been marginalized, students who uh, many of us would identify traditionally as at-risk students, students who are at risk of dropping out of school or who have academic um, competency issues and have not been as successful in a traditional educational setting. So that's really been my passion of, of work uh, for um, most of my professional life. Um, I have a beautiful family. I have a loving family who's supportive of this endeavor. And so I also have a beautiful little girl who's going to be starting school next year. Oh. And so she'll be going to Hearn Elementary uh, in our district next year. And we're really excited about that. And I think as we started talking about kind of the education program here in Franklin County and why I wanted to get involved at this level, um, she really is kind of the driving force for that. Sure. But I recognize that it's not just about my daughter, who um, I, I'll just, you know, is gifted and, and beautiful and, and smart in every way. <laughs> but it really is about every kid because my daughter and, and will have opportunities that I think other kids in our district deserve. And that's really why I wanted to run for Franklin County School Board. That's a great reason. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, that's why a lot of a lot of people who decide yeah. to run for that would would hope that that's the reason. Yeah. Um, so, what exactly are the responsibilities of a school board member? Sure. Yeah. Well, so I, a, school, a lot of folks kind of think that a school board member has direct oversight of daily management of operations in a district, and that really is not the role of of what a, a school board member does. Uh, we really are providing guidance uh, to the district in long range strategic planning. Uh, we work with the superintendent uh, and leader, district leadership to make sure that we have a, uh, that we're setting appropriate goals, that we are managing uh, the district in a responsible way. Uh, we have responsibility for um, budget allocation, for taxing, for all of those kind of very large umbrella issues. Um, and so those really, I think, set the tone for what the district puts as priorities and how we, uh, how we make commitments to certain groups of students or all students or how we do that. And so I, I think the role of a school board member in that sense is a, a kind of a, 
a very kind of high level umbrella kind of view of the of the district. Um, and a lot, you know, I, I get a lot of questions about, you know, how are particular personnel issues or things like that, which a school board typically is not involved in those kinds of decisions and that kind of daily management of a, of a district. That really is the responsibility of the superintendent and of the district leadership. Um, so what I think we're charged with primarily when I look at that, and I'm, in addition to the financial part, is getting the right people in the right places. And I think we have great leadership uh, within our district now. I mean, I, uh, Dr. Kopp is, is wonderful, and so we have, he's relatively new to our district. Mm -hmm. And so what I see is this, is that the previous board, the board who's there now, many of them will continue on as board members, uh, have done a, a great job in establishing a, a district level leadership uh, that is committed to, I think, the right causes within Franklin County. Mm -hmm. And so I see a, sta a, a school board member as really supporting that and providing that district leadership with the resources they need to implement the strategic plan that I think we have as a board and as a community. Well, that sounds like a lot of responsibility to me. It, it is a lot of responsibility <laughs> so. because there are a lot of students who are relying on that, sure. right? And our community as a whole is relying on having people who are able to uh, have a vision for what Franklin County Public Schools can be and then empowering the right people to carry out that vision. So with those responsibilities, in addition to the experience that you have, what characteristics do you feel that you have that prepare you for that responsibility? Sure. So I think part of my work now and that I've been working in for the last 14 years uh, is really a collaborative model. My work is all built around collaboration. It is about bringing the right people to the table, uh, the right stakeholders. So right now we have a board of directors that oversees our work and it is made up of school district superintendents from across the state, school administrators and teachers from across the state. We have uh, Department of Juvenile Justice represented, community-based services, Department of Education, uh, and all of those different folks coming together to really, in, our, in my, per, my particular work, is talking about what is in the best interest of the holistic development of a child. How do we meet all of the needs from all of the different sides? And so I've been very fortunate to have, uh, have great partnerships with all of those folks and pulling them together to talk about in that way. And so as I look for, toward this experience of uh, the local school board, I think part of what we really need to do is get the right people at the table and to make sure that we're having conversations with all of the different stakeholders about how we meet, meet the needs of our kids. Um, so I think that's a skill that I bring to it and that any mm -hmm. school board member should be bringing to sure. the table is we want to empower our administrators, our teachers, our students, and our parents uh, and community members who all have a stake in, in our local school district. Um, a lot of folks will say, well, I don't have kids in, in public schools, so this maybe isn't as important to me. Uh, but public schools uh, in Franklin County, I mean, we are the economic driver uh, for this entire community. So if we want to have a flourishing economic uh, program in Franklin County, if we want to develop jobs here, if we want to bring new, new jobs, if we want even our cashiers at, at Kroger to be able to correctly check, give us our change back. All of those things are impacted by the public school system. So we all have a vested interest in making sure that our students are successful. And so I really think that what I've excelled at uh, is bringing those people together. And that's what I hope to do as a school board member is really have that community engagement mm -hmm. and to have conversations about how we can do that. Um, as a candidate for school board, I think I've already started trying to do that. Uh, I've created a Facebook page. You can find it by looking for Ronnie for School Board. It's very simple. Type in Ronnie for School Board and you'll find my Facebook page. Uh, and on that, we, I've created and outlined a lot of positions around uh, particular um, things that are going on in our schools. Uh, but I've also engaged with our community and said, what are the issues that are going on that we need to be aware of and how do we address that? So I think that's a first step in bringing folks together to let's talk about our big picture Let's talk about um, strategically what we want to accomplish as a school district, and then let's put into place um, our processes for making that happen. Um, so I think yeah. that's probably part of what I bring to the table and what I would like to bring. Okay, great. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think um, the seat that you're running for inevitably is going to be a new person on the that's correct. Oh, board. That's correct. So, Jennifer Grison Brown, who has okay. been uh, the chair of the uh -huh. Franklin County School Board, has decided not to run for okay. re-election. Um, okay. So the person coming into this will be a new person. So what are uh, the advantages of having new blood on the board? 
Well, I think anytime you have new perspectives. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I would think that I'm a new perspective. I'm going to bring in a new perspective to the board. Um, we have a great board already. I'm, I, you know, I've uh, participated and watched and, and, and looked at our board for several years and, and been really actively engaged as kind of a, a, a voyeur or you know, an outside participant in mm -hmm. what the work that's taking place. And uh -huh. so I think we have a very competent board. Uh, and what I think I would bring is a different perspective in that I have a long history working in education and public education. But what I think I also bring is a statewide perspective to that. I've been in 53 school districts. We partner with 53 school districts across Kentucky. So I've seen um, the full variation of the types of programs and services that can be offered in a public school system. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think I bring that to the table and I can offer a little bit different perspective on how we compare to other districts and what we can learn from other districts. Sure. I think um, one of the things that's so important to me is um, several years ago, I started what we, in alternative education in the state, um, what we would call at the time, best practices in alternative education. It has now morphed into uh, alternative programs of distinction that's operated by the Kentucky Department of Education. And that process really invites applicants from across the state to share with us, what are innovative practices that are happening in your district? Uh, what are things that are uh, really exceptional that are moving students uh, forward in academic achievement that are having some pretty significant impacts on them? Um, so I've been involved in that process for the last 10 years, and I bring that perspective of how do we learn from, from our neighboring districts uh -huh. and also from districts across the state um, who are doing some really innovative things in, in uh, K-12 education that I think we can learn from and adapt here. Okay. Um, in education, we always say it's not stealing when you take from somebody else. It's really just you know, you're borrowing and adapting and improving mm -hmm. and and really taking ownership of that that's right. uh, of those processes. Sure. And that's what I think the perspective that I can bring uh, to the board as a new member. Great. So as a member of the board, uh, there are going to be a lot of issues facing the board. So sure. what do you think are the biggest issues facing the Franklin County Schools right now? Sure. Uh, well, I think there are a lot of issues uh, facing all public schools yeah. across Kentucky sure. right now. Um, as you know, and as we have all heard, there's been lots of rhetoric out in the public sphere about education in general. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very hot topic, not just at our local level, but at our state level and at our national level. Mm -hmm. And so I think that has some pretty serious implications on the profession of education. Uh, we can look all the way down to uh, ed teacher prep programs at universities and the enrollments in those. I think we have some significant um, gaps in uh, producing new teachers and the needs that are happening across our state for teachers. Yeah. And so you know, part of my work right now is at Eastern Kentucky University, and so I'm in the College of Education there as well. And so I see firsthand uh, the teacher preparation program and I'm familiar with what's going on there. So I think one of the most critical issues that I've, I've talked about uh, is teacher retention and recruitment. Um, and I, I think we have to look at how do we recruit the best quality teachers that we can get uh, in our county here, we should be getting the best teachers in the entire region and the entire state. Mm -hmm. And so I really think that we need to do, for me, a, an analysis of uh, not just their pay scale, which I know is low compared to our neighboring districts, mm -hmm. but we also have to look at how do we create incentive programs within our schools to retain and recruit the best qualified teachers we can. Uh, so I think that's probably one of the first issues that, that we have to deal with. I also think that um, there, there's a litany of them, but uh, school safety issues, I think, are on everybody's mind right now. Yeah. Um, you know, with the uh, tragedy that happened in Marshall County and, and with all of the other things that have happened across the country, I think parents, especially when they send their kids to school, they entrust that they are going to be safe and that they are going to be protected. Um, so I think that's an area that, that we have to work on. Uh, Franklin County Public Schools, I think, has done a really good job in developing an initial plan for school safety. They have engaged the right people, uh, and they're having ongoing conversations and trainings around that, but I think that's an area we have to stay committed to. And when I talk about school safety, for me, it's not just a school responsibility. It's a community responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that we have to engage the community in those conversations in a more meaningful way than maybe we have. Yeah. So I think teacher recruitment, I think school safety. The other thing I think is really important, and it probably is coming from my background in working in alternative education and working with kids who have been uh, marginalized uh, uh, largely in society because of things that have happened to them or things that they have been involved in, uh, is really around creating trauma-responsive schools. 
we've heard a lot of talk um, in the news and in trainings and in teacher circles about trauma-informed care, which really is uh, when we stop saying what is wrong with the kid and why do they, you know, to mm -hmm. what has happened to mm -hmm. this child that makes them act in a certain way. Sure. And it comes with the understanding that life experiences of our students outside of school really impacts what's happening in school. And so I think we have to start being responsive to that and not just informed in that we know that those things happen, but we have to move beyond being informed to how do we respond? Mm -hmm. How do we strategically talk about uh, meeting mental health needs of our kids? And so there are models across the state where they have engaged with their local mental health providers to provide mental health counseling and services in their schools and in their campuses. And I know we do that to some extent here, but I really think that that's a growing area of need. When you talk to educators anywhere, across the state or across the country. One of their biggest issues they'll tell you is that the mental health needs of their kids are getting um, just more extreme um, and more difficult to handle in a classroom setting. Sure. And so I think we have to be responsive to that. And again, as we talk about it, it's not just a school responsibility. I think a lot of folks will say, the school needs to fix this. Mm -hmm. And I think what I will say throughout this is that the school is a partner in fixing this, but right. the school is not the fixer by itself. It takes all of us coming together to talk about what's happening in our community and how we respond to that. And it's about engaging our church community, engaging our schools, engaging uh, civic organizations across the county, all of us talking about uh, those kinds of issues and, and how we can respond appropriately. Um, so I think those are big issues as well. Yeah. And then obviously, I mean, probably, you know, another, I'm sorry, I'm going, <laughs> okay. well, there are a lot of, there's, I'll just a, sit over here. <laughs> there's a lot of opportunity, I think, for growth. I mean, and education, I think, and our students are, are have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of things that are really on the forefront right now around education. Mm -hmm. So in addition to that, you know, I think we have to talk about financing of our schools, mm -hmm. especially in Franklin County. Um, we all schools across Kentucky really rely on a solid tax base, right, well, for their schools. That's for their what schools. I was going to ask you about. Yeah. You talk about all the needs that we sure. have and hating to be a Debbie Downer, but all <laughs> that takes money. Sure it and does. We're at a point yeah. right now this year where the Franklin County Fiscal Court, both of the public school districts and our city commission will soon be voting yes. to increase the tax rates. And um, can, can you identify ways that the board can... Um, identify new revenue streams. Sure. Well, one of the school. things that I, that I think is important, yeah. and I think as I'm running for school board, I have to be aware that I don't have all the answers. Yeah. Uh, I am new to this, and I'm gonna be a new member on the state board that has four other members who you know are experienced and have much more, deeper depth of knowledge uh, around these issues than I do. So I'll just say, say that up front. Sure. Um, and I think that I will rely and trust on a lot of their guidance in understanding that initially. But I do think that one of the things that I've advocated for is that we do have to do a review of how are we spending the resources we currently have. Okay. Um, and I think that we all do that, right? We all, in our private lives, in our work lives, we all have priorities of things that we would like to do. Um, and we say, can we do those kind of things? Can we afford to do that? And it talks about, and I feel like in our, in our personal actions, we have to look and say, can we do that? And how can we do it? And if we do that, what don't we do? Um, so I think the first thing that I would really ask for is a review of, of where, where are we spending our funds now? And what does that look like? Okay. But I think beyond looking at Franklin County, I think that we have to look and do some benchmarking around that and look at our neighboring districts and say, how are we comparing in our expenditures and in our revenue uh, to our neighboring districts? Um, I know just recently in the, in the State Journal, there was an article, uh, I think it was an editorial that noted that Franklin County Public Schools, I think is the third highest tax rate in our yeah. neighboring counties. Yeah. Um, when I looked at that data, I went back and looked for data. I found that we were actually the fourth from the top, uh, and there were several who were lower. There were three, I think, Henry County, Owen County, and Scott County were lower than us for our yeah. neighboring counties, but all the others were a little bit higher than us. Yeah. But I, I think that we have to look to them and say, how are we, all of these counties, how are they spending their resources, and what can we learn from that? Yeah. And then the other thing is I'm all about making priorities. And so we have to, as a board and with our district leadership, talk about what is our plan for providing educational services in our district. 
And when you have a plan, that plan drives your decision making. So I'm very data driven. I have to be in, in my work. Mm -hmm. And I think um, so we have to look at what are our needs and then how do we prioritize our budget to get there? Yeah. None of us have money for everything we want to do. Right. Yeah. So we have to make priorities and then we spend a accordingly. Um, so that's really what I would advocate for as a new person coming in is I want to know kind of where we are <clears throat> and then let's talk about where we want to be and how we get there. And that's where you spend your money. Okay. Well, our local economic development group tells us that the availability of skilled labor is a major obstacle to recruiting new businesses to this area. Sure. So what do you see um, that our schools can do to help address this issue? Great. Thank you for that. I, I absolutely agree. Uh, but it is not a, an issue that is specific to Franklin County. Yeah. Uh, that is a statewide issue mm -hmm. um, that we are, that the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce as well as the local Chamber of Commerce is working on. Uh, is, and when we talk to recruiters, when they talk to recruiters and businesses uh, across the country, that issue continually comes up. So I want to start by saying it's not something that is just happening in Franklin County. So that all of our viewers and everybody who are out there are not saying, you know, everybody else is booming and Franklin County is the one that has this issue because mm -hmm. that's that's not the reality. It's, we all share that. But what I would say is that uh, part of what I've done in my career and what I think is important is that we have to look at innovative approaches to preparing that workforce. And, you know, there is there's a discussion debate in education about what the purpose of education is. Some folks believe that the purpose of education is that we you know, become more enlightened and we mm -hmm. develop critical thinking skills and that we're able to kind of lead ethical lives of purpose and promise and those kind of things. And then there's the other kind of. Uh, train of thought that says it's really about workforce development practical, yeah. I, and the practical skills. Yeah. I think it has to be a combination yeah. of the two. Uh -huh. uh, somebody who can do practical skills but can't think critically about why they're doing those things, they're not going to grow our economy. Yeah. And on the other end, somebody who is very philosophical but can't provide any practical skill or application, mm -hmm. also not going to do us the kind of good that we need. Yeah. So I think it's the combination of that. And so I look again at innovative practices in education. And I think we have to start thinking about education delivery different um, than we have in the past. And what I mean by that is that there are students in our system who I meet every day who have very um, different learning styles, who are very practice-based learning, who are project-based learning, who are into that, kids who learn with their hands. Mm -hmm. And then we have, you know, gifted kids who are ready for college. You know, they're sophomores in high school and they're ready for college. So I think we have to look at those different kinds of programs in our district. Uh, just recently with the uh, creation of the technical school and kind of really making that kind of a, a small model of alternative education for kids who need that kind of uh, service to excel, I think is a great first step in, mm -hmm. in expanding the kinds of programs that we can offer. Um, we have kids who just don't learn well yeah. in a school with 1,200 kids. Yeah. You know, that's just not the environment and they're they're just not going to be successful there. So I think we have to look for other opportunities within that structure of how do we create innovative uh, academies within our schools. Um, and so I think that's something we can bring to the table and talk about of how we provide that workforce development mm -hmm. while also meeting those needs of having kids who develop critical thinking skills who are able to assess a situation and respond appropriately. Yeah. Those are all kinds of the things that we want. So I look at innovation and from that I take what are we learning from other districts across the state because lots of folks are doing this very well. And so we can pull from different experiences and bring those here. Well, I've toured that Career and Tech Center yeah. and it's fabulous. Good. Um, <laughs> I have a question about a new program that's being uh, implemented, the, the new Cofield High School program. Um, I think they're doing it through the Career Center. And is that, uh, is that for alternative students? Uh, I'm not as familiar with that. Okay. I'm going to be honest. I'm, okay. not, I'm not familiar with the new program that's starting. Okay. I think as a, as a new person coming into yeah. this, I have a lot to learn. Okay. And I'll be the first to admit that. I yeah. think that there's some growth opportunity there for me. And that's why I really have talked about uh, relying on the expertise of, of current board members sure. to get me up to speed as somebody new coming in yeah. who doesn't have the experience directly in the field uh -huh. uh, within Franklin County. Okay. Yeah. Um, back on the, uh, the workforce thing, another issue of local business is that even when they find skilled workers is that when they do bring them in, they don't pass a drug test. 
what can schools do to help address that? Sure. Yeah. Well, I think that this goes back to what I was talking about earlier with creating a trauma responsive school and what that means. Um, and I know that sounds like kind of a, a lofty terminology. <laughs> and what, is, what does that really mean when you, when you talk about that? I think it's an understanding that there are lots of outside factors that are impacting our kids and kids who have experienced repeated trauma. Okay. Uh, and it doesn't mean one time. So if a, a child experiences a death of a family member, that's a one-time one trauma that typically does not have, for most students, lasting impact on them. But repeated trauma in childhood, things like uh, daily exposure to drug and alcohol abuse, um, parent, one or more parent incarcerated, uh, which, you know, Kentucky has one of the highest incarceration rates of parents in the entire country. So we have lots of kids uh, in our community and across the state who have incarcerated parents. Uh, when we look at those kinds of repeated traumas mm -hmm. that happen to kids when they are very young in their formative years, when, they are, when their brain is really developing uh, at a, a speed that is uh, much faster than, than as you get older. I mean, when we have those kinds of experiences impacting them, it really changes how they think and how they view the world. And so when I talk about creating trauma-informed schools, it is about creating an environment at school that is able to be responsive to those kinds of experiences and to respond to those so that we can teach kids in our schools with partnering with our mental health providers, how do you cope yeah. appropriately with an environment where those kinds of things are happening so that you don't repeat those kinds of things. Right. Um, and that's really what I'm thinking about when I talk about trauma, uh, trauma responsive schools is partnering together so that we can do that. I think that's one step that we can do as a school is to come together and say, let's, let's teach our kids coping skills because we have an entire generation of kids right now who are in our schools whose parents are drug users, who are alcohol uh, abusers and who are incarcerated and who are being raised by grandparents. And we have all of these different things that are happening. And we have to be able to teach our kids how to handle that and function uh, in our society so that they can go on to be contributing citizens of our workforce yeah. and of our community. Yeah. Uh, that's gonna make all of us better down the road. Um, so I think that's kind of what I would start with yeah. is how we do that. Uh, and it's not easy. As a new person going in running for school board, I think I have to understand that it's not go in on the first day and all of these things are, are yeah. fixed. I mean, that's yeah. never gonna happen. It is about creating opportunities for improvement, um, you know, periodically over the phase of many years. And it will take us a long time to address these kinds of cultural issues. Absolutely. And it's not just the school's responsibility to fix yeah. all of the cultural ills that are happening. Yeah. Uh, but certainly we're a partner in that. And that's kind of what I see us doing. Yeah. Well, Ronnie, obviously you have a lot of <laughs> thoughts, a lot of great ideas, and we appreciate you coming by to share those with us. Thank you for having me. At this me. time, I'm going to ask you to look into that camera sure. and give your, your final closing as to why people should vote for you. Sure. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you for having me here. No, I really we appreciate, appreciate it. appreciate you coming in. I think part of as you're out there and you're thinking about who do I vote for uh, in this school board election, I hope that you'll consider me. I hope that you'll look at my experience. I've had 24 years of experience in the field of education. I've dedicated many of those years into serving kids who um, have been marginalized, who are on the edge of our education system. And those are the kids I think that, that really need some and deserve some additional attention. Uh, in our school system, not just in Franklin County, but across the state. So I hope that as you're making those decisions, you'll take those, uh, that experience into account. I think you'll take my educational experience into account as well. And then also my passion for education. This is where I've dedicated my life. Uh, and I really wanna bring that dedication <coughs> to Franklin County Public Schools. So I hope that uh, in addition to watching this program, you'll go to my Facebook page and just search Ronnie for school board. Uh, in your search bar and it'll bring you to my school board page where you can learn more information about me and about my candidacy, about uh, my stance on issues and what I think is important for Franklin County Public Schools. I ask for your vote on November 6th and I look forward to serving you on the Franklin County School Board. Thank you. Thank you so much Thank again you. for coming in. I know our viewers appreciate hearing from you. It's Ronnie Nolan and he's running for the Franklin County School Board. Now to our viewers, I want to remind you to get out and vote on Tuesday, November 6th 
then go home and check us out on Channel 10. We'll be bringing you live election results uh, straight from the county clerk's office. It's election season, folks, so it's time to get informed. Voice your choice, and we'll see you next time on Meet the Candidates.